Good evening and welcome to the Royal Institution. Tonight we're going to enter a world where some of the oldest visions that have stirred man's imagination blend into the latest achievements of his science. Tonight we're going to enter the world of robots. Robots like Shaky, developed by the Stanford Research Institute. Shaky is controlled by a large computer. He's directed through a radio antenna. Through a television camera, he gets visual feedback from his environment. The box appears on the monitor screen. The computer analyzes the traces which appear on the visual display until it can interpret them as an object it recognizes. Shaky gets tactile feedback through his feelers. He's able to move boxes with his push bar. He's programmed to solve certain problems that can be contrived in his environment. To choose, say, an alternative route to a certain point when his way has been blocked. Shaky is unquestionably an ingenious product of computer science and engineering. But is he anything more? Is he the forerunner of startling developments which will endow machines with artificial intelligence, enable them to compete with and even outstrip the human brain? Robots like this one in Stanford University's computer science department are able to perform certain tasks. But will robots ever be able to perform a wide variety of tasks? To learn from their experience? To use what they've learned to solve these new problems beyond those envisaged by their human programmers? Or will their so-called intelligence, their performance, remain forever at the level of a three-year-old child at its first game? One man who's pessimistic about the long-term prospects of artificial intelligence is our speaker tonight, Sir James Lighthill, one of Britain's most distinguished scientists. He's the Lucasian Professor of Applied Mathematics at Cambridge and has worked in many fields of applied mathematics. He's a former director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. Last year, he compiled a report for the Science Research Council which condemned work on general purpose robots. Not surprisingly, scientists who've been working on such robots have reacted strongly in defense of their field. Three of them are here tonight to challenge Sir James' findings. After they've had their say, the discussions will be open to bring in members of the audience here. With many mathematicians and engineers, computer scientists and psychologists among them, their contribution will be particularly welcome. Before Sir James Lighthill makes his opening, opening speech, I should like to introduce the men who will lead the debate against him. Donald Mickey is Professor of Machine Intelligence in the University of Edinburgh. His laboratory is the only one in this country engaged on large-scale robot research. John McCarthy is Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University in the United States, another great center of robot research. He's the director of Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and has flown over especially for this program. And Richard Gregory is a professor in the Department of Anatomy at Bristol University. His concern with artificial intelligence arises out of his work on perception. Before going to Bristol, he was a founder member of the Edinburgh team and helped launch its robot project. And now the moment has come to meet our principal speaker, Professor Sir James Lighthill. I'll begin by making a few distinctions between automation, which is replacing human beings by machines for specific purposes, that has made great progress in the 20th century and where the replacements have been put into effect humanely has led to general benefit, improved productivity, creating higher standards of living. And a general purpose robot, an idea that has often been described involving an automatic device that could substitute for a human being over a wide range of human activities. That's what I shall argue is a mirage. Automation is the province of the control engineer. He designs feedback control systems 
that act to reduce any change in some quantity from its desired value. For example, in this automatic aircraft landing, the throttles move so as to reduce changes in speed of the aircraft and other controls reduce deviations from the desired glide path. Increasingly, an important role in automation is played by computers. A computer is an extremely fast, reliable, and biddable device for manipulating numbers and similar symbols according to rules clearly prescribed in a program. Computers are tools of the greatest value in a very wide range of human activities, including all branches of scientific research, and we'll see examples of that, and all branches of engineering. The control engineers have made excellent use of computers in automation, for example, in numerically controlled machine tools uh, that will cut metal parts to geometrical shapes defined by equations in a program. One of the important new branches of science is computer science. Workers in computer science constantly improve our repertoire of things that can be done with computers, not just arithmetic and geometry, also algebra, and calculus, and logic. Logic by computer means manipulating symbols, symbols representing different statements, uh, in accordance with a program to find out what can be deduced from what, and so on. Advanced automation can mean automation making use of the computer's full logical potentialities developed by computer scientists. Uh, for example, in a modern uh, computer-aided design for an electrical printed circuit, the computer's role in identifying all these current paths is still very specialized, replacing human beings for a very specific purpose, but most effective. Other automatic devices exploiting the logical capabilities of computers are used to organize scientific data through data banking and retrieval. For example, in a data bank of different properties, boiling point, latent heat, etc., of hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds. I've been talking about computers and their benefits to us in a lot of fields, but I must come to the other side of the case. Computers have been oversold, understandably enough, as they are very big business indeed. It's common knowledge that some firms bought computers in the expectation of benefits which failed to materialize. My concern tonight, however, is with the overselling of the longer term future of computers. The scientific community has a heavy responsibility to put forward its carefully considered view of the facts to avoid the public being seriously misled. Just as the US National Academy of Sciences did in 1966 when it reported that enormous sums of money had been spent on the aim of language translation by computer with very little useful result, a conclusion not subsequently shaken. Failures continually occurred also in computer recognition of human speech or handwritten letters and in automatic proving of theorems in higher mathematics. But our subject tonight is robots and we must identify what they are. Several groups of able computer scientists have for many years been adopting a particular point of view regarding their work and given it a name, artificial intelligence or machine intelligence. The idea is to operate from a sort of bridge uh, between studies of how brains of living creatures work and studies of how computer programs and automatic devices based on them work. This interesting point of view has been current for over 20 years. Please notice that this view does not just mean that people who study brains, psychologists and neurobiologists should use computers. Those, as I mentioned earlier, are used effectively in all branches of science now. Nor does it mean another obvious fact that in writing programs for computers we are influenced by introspectively considering how a human brain would carry out the logical processes required. The idea of artificial intelligence means that besides doing these two things, we in engage in a definite bridge uh, activity between advanced automation uh, and computer science on the one hand and studies of brains of central nervous systems using computers on the other. The bridge activity proposed is building robots. I use robot not to mean an automatic device aimed at replacing human beings for a specific purpose in an economical way. A robot, rather, 
is um, an automatic device uh, designed to mimic a certain range of human functions without seeking in any useful sphere of human activities to replace human beings. This robot, which you've already seen from the Stanford Research Institute, is one of the most sophisticated in current operation. I'll ask, why should robots be built and studied? There are at least two serious answers to this question. First, that generalized information on automatic devices may result, which can be of use in a wide range of specialized automation problems. Second, that a device which mimics a human function, such as how we avoid an obstacle, may assist in making a scientific study of that function. I shall argue that these were eminently good and sufficient reasons for embarking on the work 20 or 10 years ago. In practice, however, the line of approach has led to somewhat disappointing results in these respects. We have acquired rather little generalized information applicable to a wide range of automation problems. Instead, we find that specialized problems are best treated by specialized methods, and I shall try to explain why that is. Similarly, the sciences of psychology and neurobiology have benefited not from robo work in general, but from those computer models that take into account really extensive bodies of experimental data on psychological behavior or on nerve cell networks in the brain. Before I expand on these reasons for a certain disenchantment with robot research, I shall predict that people nevertheless will go on building them. At all periods of history, the human imagination has been captivated by the idea that the mysterious arts, whether of the sorcerer's cell in earlier times or the scientist's laboratory today, might be used for a, a process of, as it were, artificially giving birth. Whether for this reason or not, a large section of the public finds the very idea of robots thrilling. It wants robots. It's prepared to pay for robots, if only as entertainment. One of, well, money was being made at the end of the 18th century, not only from mechanical dolls of great ingenuity, but also from exhibiting large, apparently automatic chess-playing robots. Their capabilities actually arose, like those of the Daleks today, from the presence of a man skillfully concealed inside. <laughs> Science fiction in all the media has helped to intensify this old fascination with robots as artificial beings artificially given birth. Modern robots certainly seem to imitate children in some respects. They play games, they do puzzles, they build towers of bricks, they recognize pictures and drawing books. Scientists may well find building them attractive either because the very idea exercises its old fascination on them or because the public, as represented in funding bodies, still feels that fascination enough to be prepared to pay. On this, I'll say no more. The last thing I want to do is to argue against the entertainment industry. <laughs> what I have said, however, explains my description of the general purpose robot as a mirage, meaning an illusion of something that may be strongly desired. Now I must speak of the fundamental obstacles to developments on those lines. Every existing robot operates in an extremely restricted world, a sort of playpen. Uh, that limited set of objects which are to be processed by the robot's computer program is often referred to as the program's limited universe of discourse. Such a limited universe of discourse may be a so-called tabletop world where block stacking jobs and other eye-hand operations may be carried out or it may be a drawing book for visual recognition jobs in two dimensions or a board or chess or some other game or puzzle. Whether or not there are psychological motives for a, a choice of an extremely limited playpen universe within which the robot operates, there are certainly practical reasons. The whole of a very large computer is being, all, is being used to organize the sequence of operation of one of these robots. If the universe of discourse within which it operates were made a lot bigger, the size of computer acquired would increase astronomically. This is often referred to as the combinatorial explosion. 
The combinatorial explosion means an explosive increase in the computer power required to deal with moderate increases in the so-called knowledge base, which the computer has to keep organized. It's not the movements of the robot that require these huge computer powers, it's organizing the logical analysis needed to decide its sequence of operations. A so-called self-organizing program is a program that can organize the sequence of robot operations without clues fed in from the fruits of human intelligence. Experience indicates that any self-organizing program must continually cause long searches to be made through the computer's store of data regarding the universe of discourse. A typical search might be for that combination of items and their associated attributes which satisfies some relationship necessary in solving a problem of what to do next. The combinatorial explosion means that the length of search grows explosively with an increase in the universe of discourse. Essentially because that length of search depends on the number of ways in which items in the store of data can be grouped according to particular rules and that number of ways becomes enormously large, extremely fast. Doubling the universe of discourse may make the searches thousands of times longer. All this means that any big increase in computer power that will come in the future will allow these self-organizing programs to handle only a moderately increased size of universe of discourse. All attempts at general problem-solving programs, whether concerned with theorem proving or with the so-called common sense problems that arise in most robot situations, have been and must continue to be severely limited by the combinatorial explosion in the size of problem which they can tackle. Repeated failure to get round these difficulties led to programmers being forced to adopt an expedient known as the heuristic. This is a method of constantly guiding the search by, as it were, telling the robo when it is warm and when it's getting warmer and so on. A procedure that we all know shortens any search. The heuristic is a numerical measure of how warm the computer has got, that is, of how favorable to the aims of the program is the current configuration within the computer store. It is purely human intelligence and human experience that assigns this heuristic, this evaluation function. For example, a specialized program for playing chess involves such a heuristic based entirely on human knowledge and experience of how to evaluate a chess position. This numerical evaluation includes basic elements like an estimate of the advantage of any difference in the white and black forces with the usual weightings attached to the values of different pieces, like a knight having about three times the weight of a pawn, and attaches also suitable weights to space control elements, like the added up, added up number of squares under attack from each one's pieces with extra weight for any center squares, and uh, similar numerical estimates of the extent of development of one's pieces, the degree of exposure of one's king, and so on and so forth. Because of widespread interest in finding out how good a computer might be in a complicated game like chess, devoid of any chance element, a great deal of effort by chess grandmasters, including the former world champion Botvinnik, has been expended on getting these evaluation functions better and better. Then the computer conducts at each move a long search to find a sequence that will give it the best achievable position, three or four moves ahead, assuming that its opponent makes its best replies, where best, of course, means only best from the point of view of the evaluation function. This line of research was pursued actively for over 20 years, so the results give a good indication of what can be achieved with special purpose automation when a very large amount of human knowledge and experience about the problem domain or universe of discourse, still quite a modest one in size, has been incorporated into the program. The programs play quite good chess of experienced amateur standard, characteristic of county club players in England, 
although chess masters like our own David Levy beat them easily. This story is typical of the whole range of advanced automation in general, which has made reasonable progress when directed towards some specialized purpose concerning which a very large amount of human knowledge can be incorporated into the program. On the other hand, general purpose programs cannot be designed in this way, and in any large, variegated universe of discourse, they fail by enormous margins, owing to the combinatorial explosion. The general purpose robot, then, is a mirage. The science fiction writers, possibly others, will try to keep it shimmering or appearing to shimmer there on the horizon in front of us. And there's something in most of our minds that wants to believe it's there. So many people may feel disappointed to hear it's not. Although, really, they should feel encouraged by evidence for the uniqueness of man, the uniqueness of the human race and of human brains. The many unique features of human beings include emotional drives and remarkable gifts for relating effectively with other human beings, as well as powerful abilities for reasoning over an extraordinarily wide universe of discourse. There is no reason why any of these features should be realizable in a computer of relatively simple organization driven by even a very complicated program that has been read into its store. No reason why such a combination can begin to approach what the vastly more intricate networks of nerve cells inside human skulls can do. Neurobiological research on the visual cortex has shown the extraordinary efficiency with which specialized networks of specialized neurons play their part in an analyzing visual fields. It's probable that the extraordinary self-organizing capability of the cerebral cortex has resulted from the evolution of specialized neural networks of extreme complexity, which there is no question of imitating with a programmed robot. Research on many different aspects of brain structure and function will continue and will increasingly be helped by computer-based theories adapted to the actual neurobiological data and problems and to the results of experimental psychology. At the same time, advanced automation in various specialized problem domains will forge ahead. However, the gap between these two fields will remain too great for the attempts at building a bridge between them to be effective. Always there may be some people who try to make us think we can see that old general purpose robot shimmering there on the horizon, but he's a mirage. Thank you very much, Sir James. I suspect that a number of people will be rather sad to hear that robots are a mirage. And we have here at least three people who've good reason to believe they're not. For instance, Professor Mickey runs a laboratory in Edinburgh, which is one of the world's leading centers for robot research. Don Mickey, would you like to start the discussion off? I'm certainly not going to take you up, Sir James, on the term uh, mirage, and I think to do so might be presumptuous in this company. Uh, Professor Gregory is one of the world's leading authorities in optical illusions of all kinds, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and presumably that includes mirages. But I am going to take you up quite sharply on the term general purpose, because I have the feeling that this is very near the crux of the matter. And I have a suspicion that under your term, general purpose, it's possible that there are two quite distinct and two quite important notions uh, snuggling under the same blanket. Uh, one notion being the notion of 
an experimental device, a research prototype, which one might more properly call a research purpose device, and I would be happy to talk about research purpose robots, by which one means devices which have no other purpose but, be, but to be used by scientists to advance knowledge in a particular new domain to test feasibility and to investigate principles. It's very close to the idea of the experimental prototype. I would say that the uh, primitive flying machine of the Wright brothers would be a good example of such a device, certainly general purpose. And certainly the work done with computer-controlled robots in the various artificial intelligence research laboratories around the world in the last five or six years, uh, I think could fairly be described in those terms, research purpose robots. The other concept which I think comes under the same uh, term of general purpose and may be confused with it is the notion of versatility, by which one means the ability to reinstruct uh, re-educate almost a device rather quickly and rather easily and rather conveniently from the point of view of the human user. And this property of versatility is of extreme interest to workers in the field of artificial intelligence and it's not entirely without relevance uh, in the future, perhaps in the industrial applications of robotics to assembly line operations and similar tasks. One of the problems in the industrial context is the problem of short runs, where a given product, product has its specifications changed every few weeks or every few months, uh, requiring radical uh, retooling and uh, writing off of assembly equipment. And there's a good deal of interest at present in industry in, in how to incorporate versatility in such devices, research on versatility in programming systems of a complex kind which have to deal with fragments of the real world is one of the studies which may lead towards that end, quite apart from its own intrinsic interest. Now in Edinburgh, we have made some identifiable steps in the, that direction. The film that I'm going to show now is uh, reasonably described, I think, as the Edinburgh research purpose, versatile uh, assembly robot, uh, locally described as uh, Freddy. That is Pat Ambler on the left, Rod Burstall, who supervised this work in the last years, putting a heap of parts on the platform. Uh, this is the beginning of the execution phase of the program. The previous teaching phase, which occupied altogether two days, uh, isn't shown here and the parts can be dumped at random and have been and in fact an extra part which doesn't belong to that assembly kit at all but belongs to a ship assembly kit uh, this one has been thrown in for good measure that is the oblique camera uh, that uh, is responsible for uh, building up an internal model of the overview of the whole platform when it comes to detailed examination the overhead camera is used as here in a moment, that outline will be replaced by an approximation in terms of line segments, and there are elaborate data structures in the machine memory, which is a large part of the research interest, uh, which form uh, compact and convenient uh, descriptions of the messy images seen by the television camera. Having identified that as a car body, it's being uh, picked up and put in the assembly station in a stereotyped position, ready for the second phase of the program, which we'll see uh, later, and which has less of interest in it from an artificial intelligence point of view. But the points of interest in this first part of the program are to do with constructing internal descriptions of messy and complex external phenomena, um, including, for example, uh, jumbled heaps of that sort, as the basis for identification where possible and where not possible appropriate action. In the case of a heap, uh, there's a whole uh, repertoire of strategies available of which the first will be to attempt to identify a, protru a protuberant part uh, and then an attempt will uh, be made to pick it up. 
These are potential uh, hand positions. There's a little bit of internal planning going on to try and find positions for placing the two hands which will be suitable for grabbing that protuberant part without fouling any of the other um, objects. And now having selected a pair of positions, um, we're doing a pickup. The system will now look around the platform. That little twitch was to shake off anything which might have uh, been associated, picked up by mistake with the, with the rest. <coughs> having found an empty place that's being put down, it will now be examined by the overhead camera. A caricature, a simple description made. Um, and uh, this will be matched through what the computer memory holds in the way of descriptions and identified as a wheel, hopefully, and then picked up and put in a suitable place uh, preparatory for the final assembly. We're now, uh, we've jumped a bit and we're now nearing the end of this part of the program. This is the last wheel to be identified and now all the parts are laid out and the second part uh, is just about to begin. The second part perhaps looks a little smoother. It's very much less interesting. Um, it's done blind, no use of vision at all. Uh, quite considerable use of touch. Uh, for this purpose, the system has a primitive workbench, and that's a little vice. It's about to close the, the jaw on the wheel in order to clamp it in a more or less standard position. The only really high-level routines available as commands to the uh, programmer in instructing the put, putting together part are um, two, which we'll see illustrated in a moment. These little feeling operations are simply updating its internal model to correct the dead reckoning. Um, in fitting the axle into the hole, uh, one of the high-level routines was used, a spiral search in which it goes around in a widening spiral uh, prodding and when it meets no resistance uh, pushes it home. The next uh, operation is to insert the axle into one of the holes through the car body. And this is spiral search again which has been successful. The difference between the two parts of the program, the second part is uh, fairly conventional uh, programming, simply taking advantage perhaps of a reasonably uh, various and well-documented library of robot support software. But the difference between that and the earlier part, the vision and, lay and the layout, can be illustrated by the effects of interference. If things go wrong, during the assembly phase, the one that I'm saying is far the less intelligent of the two, insofar as that word should be introduced at all, uh, if you at this stage were to knock the partially completed assembly onto the floor, uh, the program would never recover from it. But if you do things like that in the earlier stage, it has a sufficiently elaborate model of its world and a sufficiently broad repertoire of strategies in general to be able to um, recover and push the job through to completion. So in that sense, one derives a valuable degree of robustness from the employment of some of these techniques. Well, this is the final <laughs> assembly test. Since then, uh, a slightly more advanced tour de force has been attempted and in fact succeeded, which was to teach the system to approach a jumbled part, uh, a jumbled heap consisting both of car parts and ship parts, completely mixed up, and successfully disentangle them, identify them, and construct one finished car and one finished ship. Um, there are, in that uh, innocently, decept uh, deceptively uh, simple looking program, a number of techniques which we regard as artificial intelligence techniques. We have a number of fairly concrete ideas about how some of the crudities uh, should be uh, improved and more intelligent 
features and considerable shortening of the instruction time introduced. My main thesis is that work in this area is work in an area of science which has an existence in its own right, that artificial intelligence is indeed a subject with its own purposes, its own criteria, and its own professional standards. And it is not to be identified with specific application areas. Well, Sir James, what about the versatile research purpose robot? Is that a mirage? Well, I, I thought that um, in many respects, um, Professor Mickey's uh, film was a good illustration of the description that I'd given of the um, uh, the, the, the robot uh, uh, as a device designed to mimic a certain range of human functions without seeking any useful sphere of human activities to replace human beings, operating in a playpen world with its toy car and its toy ship and a small universe of discourse and therefore able to solve the logical problems that were involved in, in, in organizing the program. I would certainly agree with Professor Mickey's implication uh, that in certain factory jobs one can create an artificially small enough universe of discourse so that one can think in terms of carrying out this type of logical organization of the task. Um, of course, uh, against that is the fact that um, those who are involved in industrial automation are already doing this uh, uh, by their own methods. It's not the people who work in laboratories called AI laboratories that have a monopoly of thinking how to um, organize uh, tasks uh, on the fact, in factories uh, of, of, of how to carry out uh, these uh, operations in small universes of discourse. Yes. Uh, just a brief interruption, Sir James. Uh, industrial robots are becoming quite common in factories, but they do have one thing in common, and that is that up to the present date, uh, no use of visual sensing has yet been achieved on a practicable scale, and very little tactile sensing. I thought for a moment you were implying that there was not likely to be a chain of beneficial influence between research studies of this kind and the uh, factory robotics of a few years hence. We still have to incorporate, and there are members here of industrial um, automation groups who can confirm it, some of these facilities in, in the industrial environment. But um, there are firms that are doing very good visual pattern recognition and analysis by what I would call relatively conventional data processing uh, methods, firms like I Image Analysis Computers Limited. Professor uh, McCarthy, well, one of the things I, I'm finding difficult to, to understand is, is this distinction between advanced automation and what you call artificial intelligence. Can you define for us what this distinction is? What is artificial intelligence? Okay, artificial intelligence is a science, uh, namely it's the study of problem solving and goal achieving processes in complex situations. Um, it's a basic science like mathematics or physics and has problems distinct from applications and distinct from the study of how uh, human and animal brains uh, work. Um, it requires experiment uh, to carry it out. Now. Um, it involves about a very large number of parts to it, of which I will mention precisely four. One of them is the processes of search, uh, which are dealing with a combinatorial explosion. Now, uh, it seemed from what you said that you had uh, just discovered that as a problem, but in fact, the very first work in artificial intelligence, namely Turing's, uh, already treated the problem of combinatorial explosions and there has been um, a very large part of the work in artificial intelligence especially game playing has dealt with that the next problem is the representation of information internally in the machine both information about particular situations that the machine has to deal with uh, the representation of procedures and the representation of general laws of motion, which determine 
uh, the future is a function of the past. A third problem is advice giving, how we are going to instruct the computer or communicate with it. At present, programming um, that is uh, influencing a computer program is as though we did education by brain surgery. Uh, now, if you're going to do education to teach a child how to multiply by brain surgery, uh, then you had better have a thorough understanding of how his brain works in detail and be able to get in there and make the desired changes. Uh, this is inconvenient with children and is also um, inconvenient uh, with computer programs. Uh, progress is being made on this. The fourth that I want to mention can be called compiling, or now the word used is automatic programming, but in an extended sense beyond the way it's used normally in the computer industry. And that is going from information uh, that determines how something should be done to a rapid machine procedure for efficiently carrying this out. Uh, this is one of the major topics. Uh, now, I should remark with regard to all of these topics that they can be treated independently of applications or, and independently of how the brain works. And I would be perfectly glad to treat any one of these that you choose. Um, on general purpose robots, I'd like to remark that it's in your sense of a, in the strong sense of a general purpose robot, one that would exhibit human quality intelligence, if not, so to speak, quantity, but would be able to deal with a uh, wide variety of situations. The problem, the situation is even in worse shape than you think. Uh, <laughs> namely, even um, the, the general formulation of what the world is like has not been accomplished, so that even if you are prepared to lead the machine by hand through the combinatorial explosion, that is, to tell it which things to do next, uh, you still cannot make it with the present formulations uh, decide how to solve a complex problem. Um, now, uh, this in fact has turned out to be the difficulty, not the combinatorial explosion. Uh, the common sense programs have occupied relatively little uh, computer time in the areas in which they were capable of doing, or at least many of them have anyway, uh, but uh, simply have too limited a formulation. Now, uh, part of this is due to a defect in current systems of mathematical logic, where the systems are uh, designed to be reasoned about uh, rather than to be uh, reasoned in. Now, uh, I want to ask you a question, or maybe it's a rhetorical one, um, which is in the documents that you received before you wrote your report and in the um, uh, comments that you received after you received the report, almost everyone made the point that AI was a separate subject uh, with goals of its own and uh, not intended to be a bridge between the other things. I would like to ask you, was it merely for tactical reasons that you chose to um, ignore that anyone was even making this contention? I'd like to answer that question. I think it's a very important question. Um, you see, in this country, there are a large number of first-rate computing science laboratories which have preferred not to call themselves AI laboratories, but have uh, concerned themselves with what Professor McCarthy calls the central area of his field, namely the study of problem-solving and goal-achieving uh, programs. And uh, these have been uh, tackled in their own right as fundamental computer science. Many of the points that uh, he's mentioned come in, for example, uh, search in the whole field of uh, information retrieval, uh, compiling, where our fine um, computer science laboratories have been much involved in producing advanced programming lang languages. Um, these, uh, I was, was uh, grouping 
with advanced automation for a very good reason, because uh, extremely often one, one finds that the uh, stimulus of a really important practical problem in automation um, is, is the thing that uh, causes solutions, new solutions to be found uh, to these questions and these add the rep it to the repertoire of what computer scientists can do. Now, uh, what are the arguments for not calling this computer science as I did in my talk and in my report and calling it artificial intelligence is because one wants to make some sort of analogy. One wants to, to bring in uh, what one can gain uh, by a study of how the brains of living creatures operate. This is the only possible reason for calling it artificial intelligence. Let's instead. See, excuse me. Uh, I invented the term artificial intelligence. I invented it because we had to do something when we were trying to get money for a summer study in, <laughs> uh, in 1956. And I had a previous bad experience. Hmm. Um, the previous bad experience concerns occurred in 1952 when Claude Shannon and I decided to collect a, a batch of studies uh, which we hoped would contribute to launching this field. Uh, and Shannon thought that artificial intelligence was too flashy a term and uh, might uh, attract unfavorable notice. And so we agreed to call it automata studies. And I was terribly uh, disappointed when the papers we received were about automata. And uh, very few of them had anything to do with the goal that at least I was interested in. So I decided not to fly any false flags anymore. Uh, but to say that this is a uh, study aimed at the long-term goal of achieving human-level intelligence. Uh, since that time, many people have quarreled with the term, but have ended up using it. Um, Newell and Simon, the group at Carnegie Mellon University, tried to use complex information processing, which is certainly a very neutral term. But the trouble was that um, it didn't identify their field because everyone would say, well, I, my information is complex. I, I don't see what's special about you. Yes. Well, Newell and Simon, I think, are a good example of people who've moved a little bit towards the problem of, of, of trying to do psychology. They've been actually saying, how do human beings solve simple problems? And we all try to do a theory of this. And this is obviously a very desirable thing to do also. But I, I'm trying to, to suggest that we, we would uh, be much clearer in what uh, we, we attempt if when we are trying to do psychology and neurobiology, we think of ourselves as psychologists and neurobiologists and work with all the other guys in the field. And uh, when we're trying to do advanced automation and computer science, we work with people like control engineers who, do, who developed an awful lot of experience of how to do uh, advanced automation well, and also with the key problem of how to actually get it into practice, all that business of humanely introducing it and so on that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. I, I think this is where we must ask Richard Gregory to come and help us, because uh, he, 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 his research is in, in perception. Uh, to what extent has have the robot studies of uh, Mickey and McCarthy helped in this work, Richard? Well, I, th I want to say that, fact that it's the general concepts which are coming out of artificial intelligence which are having an impact in psychology rather than the specific programs, for example, on neural nets, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I go a little further than that. I may be exaggerating a little, but let me put the point. I think since behaviorism started in about 1900 and then Skinner, and the stimulus response paradigm for psychology, experimental psychologists on the whole were regarding human beings as examples of advanced automation, where you have a stimulus coming in, a response coming out, and there's a black box in the middle, and that's it. Now, what I think is becoming very apparent is that human beings are not at all like that, that we have a vast amount of data store inside us, that we have extremely noisy, often directly not relevant information available to us that we make rather good on the whole decisions, we act extremely reliable, reliably with poor input. 
Now, what's happened, I think, with the um, robot studies, and I think Donald was getting at this, is that we were all shocked and amazed how difficult it was because we were misled by the total inadequacy of psychological theory and the emphasis that was put on stimulus response. Now, what it's turning out, I think, is that the stimulus is not directly controlling behavior. It's rather calling up. Uh, generally speaking, and in normal situations, an appropriate internal model, map, hypothesis of the external world, and it's this that we act upon. So it's not stimulus response, it's rather a certain amount of rather grotty information, a hopefully adequate internal model, and then the response based on that, much as a hypothesis in science enables one to make a decision, but the hypothesis is the result of a great deal of past information and generalization which has been logically organized, and then the decision is made far more on what is internally represented than on what is available at that time, either available to the eye or to the telescope or to the microscope or to the uh, electrical instrument of, of an engineer. I think this is what's happened. So the emphasis on internal data and how it's organized logically is what's happening from the robot research. So I think to say that this is a business of models of neural nets is what we thought 10 years ago and it's what we very much moved away from. Now, to sort of finish this a little bit, the point about intelligence is this, it exists because we're intelligent. We have 10 to the 10 components in a box about the size of a football on top of our shoulders. 10 to the 10 components is a lot, but an awful lot of that is used up in vegetative functions like my tongue having to waggle about and this kind of thing in order to communicate. The actual number of neurons responsible for intelligence may be very, very much smaller than that. Uh, I see no reason why we cannot, in fact, make brains because they exist physically. When you say the brain is unique, you at one time said it's unique because it's big. You then made remarks that there are certain circuits in the brain which we can't replicate. Now, I would like to have an argument to show why this pessimism is justified. It seems to me pure pessimism or metaphysics. It's worse. It contradicts yeah. a mathematical theorem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't really mm. expect that I would mm. ever... Let Sir James answer... Well, uh, I mean, it's, uh, Professor Gregory seemed to uh, make two almost contradictory points. First, he said that neural nets don't matter. And finally, he said that they're, in the end, the thing we ought to be researching on most. Uh, I think he's been a bit unfair to experimental psychologists because uh, I think uh, they have been working on, um, on, on internal stores of, of information. They've been working on short-term memory and long-term memory and these things, and they've used computer models to, to find out the relation between these uh, different things. But of course, I do agree with his statement uh, that uh, we have learned a lot from the research in artificial intelligence, uh, essentially finding out how difficult it was. We were all shocked and amazed to find out how difficult it was, namely to extract information from uh, noisy pictures, from, from, um, from sense impressions of the real complex uh, world. And um, the evidence that we in fact do it by comparing with some sort of internal model, and this is a, a, a key feature that has come out of the work. Of course, it's um, arguing against the uh, ho uh, hopes for, art for um, general purpose robots because they would have to have such a very complicated internal model, such a large internal universe of discourse that they'd be working um, with in order to identify uh, what they were seeing in the real world. But now I'll come to his last point where he comes back to neural networks. I mean, I pointed out that the difference between a, um, a, a, a current computer architecture, which by comparison with um, the cerebral cortex is, is, is a very simple architecture and all the complication is built into the program. I, I said that there's no reason to suppose that that type of architecture plus program can uh, begin to approach what the vastly more intricate networks of, ne of nerve cells inside human skulls can do. And of course, there's the a theorem mm, that says it can. Um, I, I, I don't think a theorem that says it can in a way that can be realized in a, in a time that is acceptable because of the difficulties of the combinatorial expression. I mean, the theorems with which Professor for which Professor McCarthy is justly 
famous, and Professor Robinson and others uh, have pointed out that problems can be, can be solved by algorithms, but the algorithms all involve enormous uh, lengths of, of time with any reasonably sized universe of discourse because of the combinatorial explosion. No, 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 you're, con mm -hmm. uh, but you're could, confused. Could we have Richard Gregory, first of all, to see whether the, 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 this point has been answered about whether... But there's a mathematical whether, question uh, we might succeed yeah. in answering. Whether it, it is possible to construct a, an artificial brain. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to know in what sense you felt what I was saying was self-contradictory. I'm not saying one shouldn't study neural nets, but I think... I mean, you said they were existing ten years ago, but I mean, yes. in actual fact, there's been some quite good work on, on new ideas of, of how neural nets can achieve specific uh, tasks uh, in the last few years. Uh, I mean, it is an active field of research at the moment. Yes, I'd like to submit that perhaps the concept of restraints is important here, that mm. if you have a system which is following logical operations, it has to have, has to have physical restraints corresponding to the logical steps required to produce the solution, whereas the network, such as Burl's work, was more on whether it's going to, so to speak, catch fire, run away with itself, this kind of thing, a very, very crude um, work. I mean, it was brilliant at that time, but now it looks terribly crude because it isn't mm. concerned with the state of the net for the specific problem. And it seems to me now the emphasis is on the logic of the problem. The next question will be how the physiology carries it out, but we haven't yet even begun to answer that question. Now, what the robot stuff is beginning mm. to that do is, really is really. to show how it can be carried mm. out with electronics. And this is a lead, I think, to how physiological research may go when the cognitive process has become respectable within physiology, which is only just happening. And the respectability, I think, is coming with the robot research. It's making the logical cognitive processes scientifically respectable. And this is a very great thing it's doing. Mr. James. For different uh, functions, I think the answer is, uh, is different. Uh, where, where it comes to simpler parts of the brain, like the cerebellum, uh, I think it is uh, already beginning to be possible to uh, identify the function of, of, of neural networks. But I did feel that the cerebral cortex is, is, is incomparably more difficult. Uh, that's why we need the robot research. This yeah. is my point. It's, it's extremely difficult. You are not saying that there is any fundamental reason why it's impossible. It's just extremely difficult. Well, uh, I, I do feel uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, my uh, neurophysiologist friends tell me that contemplating the complexity of, of the extraordinary random appearance of the connection of all the nerve cells in the cerebral co cortex makes them feel that it is quite hopeless to attempt an right. analysis. Tom, uh, yes, uh, Professor McCarthy, you wanted to say something earlier. earlier right, I, I would like to get, uh, make it clear what the theorem is. Uh, not due to me. Uh, or there are several theorems, as a matter of fact. The first one is due to McCulloch and Pitts, uh, which was the 1943, that a certain kind of neuron that they were fascinated with uh, could um, exercise any logical, uh, do any logical calculations. Another theorem along the same line was in Minsky's PhD thesis, which he sh in which he showed that any element that had uh, essentially what it amounted to negative resistance uh, could do it. Now, the simulation theorem would say the following, that the time required to simulate a device with 10 to the 10th components would si be simply proportional to the number of components, provided you have a large enough memory, that is a 10 to the 10th element memory, uh, to do the table lookups in. Now, one certainly would not advocate um, having an intelligent machine that would uh, do this by uh, simulating the neuro net, neural net in the brain. In the first place, you can't find out what the neural net is. And in the second place, there are uh, almost certainly better ways of doing it, since the neural net in the brain um, is, quite, uh, uh, is quite inefficient. But uh, nevertheless, there are some mathematical theorems that say that the uh, time required would really be only linear in the amount, number of components. But that is only if you can unravel this extraordinarily complex network and decide how it, uh, it, it, it does it. And well, I, I will respect, I feel that is not so. Uh, Minsky's perceptrons uh, and so on uh, uh, were obviously a very interesting investigation. It's not certain that the um, 
that the neurons uh, are, are all of this type, as I say, the Minsky's ones against individual. against perceptrons. The, yes, I know. He's written a book recently which, 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 which sums up and says that uh, they haven't got us anywhere. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, uh, and um, uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the detailed work on the visual cortex has shown uh, that, that, that various specialized hardware, as, uh, as a computer architect would speak, or is involved in uh, the discrimination between edges, vertical edges, discrimination, distance, and so on. Donald Mickey? Uh, I wonder if I could follow the combinatorial explosion just a little, and first of all ask whether the problem of programming a computer to play chess is a reasonable instance of the kind of difficulty that you have in mind. I think, in fact, you've quoted it uh, as an instance. Uh, there's an alternative of about 20 moves, 20 legal moves at each stage, so that you can work out, and my colleague I.J. Good has worked out, that the total number of possible chess games is of the order of uh, 10 to the 120, which is more than the number of uh, elementary particles in the observable universe. So that if you want combinatorial explosions, that's quite a nice big one. There are two ways, uh, two lines of approach that artificial intelligence people attempt to use to damp off and combat the combinatorial explosion. Roughly speaking, they can be grouped into syntactic methods of cutting down this wild branching ratio on the one hand, and on the other hand, and in the long run, much more significant and more promising, uh, ways of building semantic information into the program in order to cut out uh, whole branches of the search tree. Most of the progress that has been made with computer chess so far, in fact almost all of it, would come under that first and rather primitive category. And in spite of that, I think you said yourself, the present level of computer chess is perhaps uh, a middling club player, you said an experienced amateur. Um, have you, first of all, uh, read the article in the June issue of the Scientific American where the first uh, program with semantic, uh, uh, with semantics built in um, has been described and looked at the quality of the game that's there cited? Secondly, um, you mentioned David Levy and you mentioned Botvinnik, the former world champion. Uh, do you know about David Levy's bet and do you know about Botvinnik's comment on it? Yes, well, I do. And of course, the interesting thing is that this. Well, uh, one of you tell us. Uh, about <laughs> <laughs> well, David, David Levy is an international master. And in 1968, he wagered a thousand pounds against a consortium uh, that no computer program would beat him across the board in a 10-game match uh, before 1979. It had to be done by the end of 1978. I can reveal the identity of the consortium. Uh, it consists, in fact, of Seymour Peppert, John McCarthy, and myself. <laughs> now, it seems to me <laughs> that if your pessimism is as deep-rooted as you wish us to believe, and the power of the combinatorial explosion, everything that you've stated, you should be ready to double that stake. <laughs> I've picked on chess because it's an area where one can put in a maximum amount of human knowledge and experience of something that human beings have been very active in for centuries, and one can feed in through the heuristic um, as, as much as possible. Uh, the, the heuristic has been the main method of uh, of reducing the impact of the com combinatorial e explosion. And um, even in spite of, of this, uh, one is able to uh, reach, uh, in a fairly modest universe of discourse, the chessboard with its 64 squares, one is able to reach the kind of um, uh, levels of, of play that, uh, that, that we've described. Um, the program that you saw in fact, involved not a complete uh, search of every um, uh, possibility in the tree. There was um, a rejection of possibilities at an early stage. If um, 
the position started deteriorating fast uh, and um, uh, so a certain selection from the more promising lines was, is made in this program and the programs have been constructed with a very great deal of ingenuity. It's been one of the classic problems in um, computer science, uh, something that everyone would like to solve. Com computer firms have, have, have tried because they would like to see um, uh, a success of computer against um, uh, a master or grandmaster in this field. But nevertheless, this has not been achieved and David Levy still doesn't seem to think it will be achieved and I agree with him. Yes. I think that I would like, if I might be allowed to utter a small warning here dredged up from the remote past nearly a hundred years ago. It is in fact a very short excerpt that I want to read from a report. It was a report submitted on November the 15th, 1876 uh -huh. to the President of the United States Telegraph Company. And it goes as follows. Mr. G. G. Hubbard's fanciful predictions, while they sound very rosy, are based upon wild-eyed imagination and a lack of understanding of the technical facts of the situation and a posture of ignoring the obvious technical limitations of his device which is hardly more than a toy, a laboratory curiosity. Mr. A.G. Bell, the inventor, <laughs> is a teacher of the hard of hearing, and this telephone may be of some value for his work, but it has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Yes. <laughs> If I had given my talk ten years ago, um, it would have been a very reasonable response uh, to, to, res to respond by, by quoting uh, what was said about Bell's inventions within a year or two after they'd started to be investigated. But uh, the situation is different when one's past the quarter century of a field like, like artificial intelligence. This is a, then one comes into a period where uh, some of the fundamental difficulties have, have begun to, to emerge. I have made it clear that I support a great deal of the work uh, that is done by people calling themselves the artificial intelligentsia, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, but I, I have all also argued uh, that uh, enough of the fundamental objections uh, and difficulties have um, now e e emerged so that one can, feel, uh, one, one can feel dubious to a very high degree about <coughs> predictions of a general purpose robot. Well, perhaps uh, this is a good time to leave the artificial intelligentsia and get to the members of our audience. Well, perhaps uh, this is a good time to leave the artificial intelligentsia and get to the members of our audience uh, and ask them whether they'd like to make any points to Sir James or to the other principal speakers. Question here. My name is Dr. Larkin. I work at the uh, Department of Computer Science at the University of Warwick. I make robots. In particular, I make a robot called Arthur, <laughs> who's mobile and blind unlike Professor Mickey's, which is a hand-eye robot, uh, although I must admit that Professor Mickey moves the world rather than moving his robot in the world. Now, I call what I do with this robot psychomechanics. I prefer it. It's one word rather than two, artificial intelligence, and probably describes more accurately what I'm trying to do. But this is a subject, as far as I'm concerned, which is firmly embedded in computer science. I'm in a computer science department. And it involves, the work I'm doing involves uh, the kind of advanced programming that we've uh, heard about, but the work I'm doing also affects our concepts of what a computer is, or rather, what a psychomechanism is. Because a computer is not the, the beast for doing the job we're talking about. A computer is designed to do sums. And uh, we, we have to look into the design of the machine we're using to do the actual uh, thinking part of, of the task and see whether we can't redesign that as well. And this is the area I'm at present 
uh, very much concerned in. Now, when we get into the area of psychomechanisms, and that's a psychomechanism, uh, it's uh, fairly small, but if I use that as a computer, which I could do, it's more powerful than the first computer I first worked on, a juice computer, and that used to fill a room. Now, psychomechanisms have some form of intelligence. I don't think there's any uh, dispute about that. But there's no spectrum of intelligence for robots uh, the way there is a spectrum of intelligence for animals. For instance, my robot, Arthur, could be described as a literate dog. Now, just how general purpose is a literate dog? <laughs> Uh, well, how does Arthur rate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think if you really uh, investigate the full range of psychological uh, functions and capabilities of a dog, you'll find that it's well ahead of all these robots. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Roger Needham, Cambridge University. I think one root of the disagreement between Professor McCarthy and Professor Lighthill is that the one believes and the other doesn't that there is a subject to study of problem solving and goal seeking which is quite independent of any particular sort of problem or any particular sort of goal now it seems to me that it would be a good thing to help resolve this this being an issue on which i myself in some intellectual doubt as to if we could have a list of the achievements in problem solving and goal seeking without any reference at all to what kind of problem or goal it is. Uh, one achievement has been what I call the separation of heuristics from epistemology as a, uh, a subject, namely uh, the, um, the, the search processes are the heuristic, is the domain of heuristics and the epistemology is the formalism that you use to represent information and uh, describe the world. Um, another achievement is the Winograd achievement of showing that keep carrying semantic information as you go along uh, is the key thing even in parsing a sentence. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, this work uh, basically refutes the uh, Chomsky school mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of uh, grammar uh, because it's not merely general semantic information about the meanings of words which is being carried along, but which is being used, but information about the particular situation in which the sentence is uttered. I don't think it's necessary to go through the large list. Uh, Indeed, of course, I don't deny the accuracy of what's been said, and things like the involvement of semantics, I'm very glad that people who wish to make robots do things have learnt about that, because it's been known for a very long time. All I would like to point out is that these are somewhat in the area of anecdotes, the swallows that might begin to make the summer, rather than beginning to look like the coherent structure of a coherent scientific discipline, which I gather Professor McCarthy claimed that this, that this all was. Okay, as to its coherence, well, it's a bit weak now uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is one might call the look ma no hand school of programming, which says <laughs> that you take something that no one has ever done before and you write a program to do it and you call your friends and you write a paper and they admire the fact that it did it uh, with uh, no effort to connect this into any, um, in, in any coherent theory. The other thing which inhibits theory in, in artificial intelligence um, is that the, it can be immediately checked out by whether it really does provide the behavior uh, that it is supposed to. So uh, the apparent existence of theories in fields like uh, psychology um, is very often a mirage. Uh, <laughs> and I would say that the, th that the theoretical situation in AI is very tough. And uh, now uh, I've been in this field 
uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years, and I'm not discouraged yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't identify uh, the rise of the science and its reaching its peaks uh, with, that, with my own career. I imagine that uh, the science will continue to grow uh, even after I am not actively making contributions to it. Yes. Did you want to add anything uh, else? Uh, right. Mr. Stretch here from Oxford University. Uh, thank Professor McCarthy. I've also been in the game about 20 years. Nor am I discouraged. But I do not choose to work in the field of artificial intelligence because I think it is too difficult. Uh, I would like to uh, make a comment about Professor Bickey's anecdotal method of supporting uh, uh, work in a, in a very difficult field by quoting a totally irrelevant, incorrect pr prophecy about Bell, Bell's telephone a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, a more recent incorrect prophecy uh, was made about the ability to translate uh, human languages by machines, uh, and that turned out exactly the opposite way. The general, the general view, opinion was that it would be possible to translate uh, uh, or do have machine translation of human languages e efficiently and economically. It turned out, in fact, of course, that it was rather cheaper to use a human being than to use any, any uh, translation mechanism. I think it's a mistake to confuse the uh, intellectual difficulties uh, with, um, with these fields. I think it's to, to underestimate them. I'm, always, I'm a bit surprised by the way in which the people who seem to work on artificial intelligence come along and say, oh, well, we started off like this, and after quite a short time, we were horrified to find it was all rather difficult. Now, it seemed to me that if you looked at the field uh, with a dispassionate view 20 years ago, you would very soon find that it was extremely hard. I wrote a program to play checkers or drafts about 20 years ago, and uh, ran, ran immediately into the combinatorial explosion, had a look at it, and came to the conclusion that that was not for me. Um, uh, and Samuel's program? Sir? And Samuel's program for the same game? Samuel's program for the same game is an example of advanced automation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, um, <laughs> let, let's just let Professor Strozier finish. Uh, I think Samuel's program, and so I think would you, is, is an example of advanced automation where he's built into the program the properties of the game. Right, Donald Mickey. I was just going to say that I think Professor Strachey is a little too modest in that he was his own work on checkers in the 1950s was in fact the launching pad from which Samuel subsequently developed his uh, checkers learning program. Furthermore, uh, Samuel's program uh, has played a worthy and useful role and many people have learned many things from it. <laughs> well, if I may just uh, conclude, uh, one of the most valuable uh, roles that's played in the general rather than the technical area is discrediting the crude versions of the doctrine that you only get out what you put in because eventually Samuel's program learned to be a better checkers player than Samuel himself. But not, if I may come back on that, a better player than the people whose games he played into it. Now, um, I object very strongly uh, no, to the... I object... Yes, I I object very strongly to the uh, 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 miscellaneous and irresponsible use of words like learning which have no very clear meaning. They are emotive terms. I do not believe that, checkers is, that Samuel's Checkers Pair is in any genuine sense a learning program. It's an optimizing program. I do not call optimizing programs learning programs. Uh, I mean, it's not the point of place to go into technical details, but there's a very great tendency I find with people working in the artificial intelligence field to make really to, to, to spoil their case by using normal human terms, anthropomorphic terms, about very, very, very simplified objects, things like advice takers. The advice taker, the, the chess advice taker, is simply a programming system. It's, not, it's a more specialized advice taker than my ordinary programming language compiler and loader. That will take advice. Uh, it isn't an advice taker, it's, inst it's a way of instructing the computer to do something. Now, I, I think to use the word advice taker when you mean a program is uh, misleading. Oh, yes. 
I'm Richard Parkins and I'm a computer scientist. And it seems to me that Professor Lighthill and the artificial intelligentsia are arguing not about things, but about the names of things. Because whenever the artificial intelligentsia have produced what they consider to be a good example of artificial intelligence, Professor Lighthill has turned around and said, yes, that's a marvellous piece of work, but it's some other field. Do you want to answer that at this well, point? Well, it's certainly true that I believe in having uh, the minimum amount of philosophical mystification in, in talking about science. I agree with Professor Strachey that when we're talking about programs, we should call them programs, and when we're talking about brains, we should call them brains. Um, You've been uh, silent for some time, Richard Gregor. Do you want to say something? Yeah. I'm a bit worried, so to speak, about the philosophical position here. When you say <coughs> you can recognize that a problem is beyond science, I think you're really saying it's beyond any future science. This is, a bit, I think, a bold claim. For example, alchemy, uh, the transmutation of gold, I'm chairman can check on my facts here, mm -hmm. I understand, was accepted as possible right through the Middle Ages, then it was damned by science, and then it was done with atomic power. I think I'm correct. Well, there are many examples all through science. The, the need for a vital yes, force, so mm. for example, in, in organic chemistry is one of, yes. the, one of the best. And uh, inevitably, almost, they have, been, uh, they have been shown to be wrong, these restrictions. But I think... Uh, there are limits I think, to uh, how far forward in the centuries exactly. we, we can even uh, I think contemplate. You did, in fact, mm. Sir James mm. might have did, did eventually say that it was, it was not impossible, but it was highly improbable this was the point wasn't it well, well, I, I think that in practical terms it's it, it, it's a mirage in the sense that if it's something that we think we can see in the horizon in the sense that uh, on our deathbeds it may be announced or uh, our children will see mm. it uh, yeah, that it's that it's really there on the horizon uh, then I, I disagree with such a view well we have uh, half a dozen people wanting to talk but I'm afraid time's running out and I must wind up the discussion stimulating as, as it's been. I'd like to thank all those who've taken part and especially our principal speakers, Professor Mickey, Professor McCarthy and Professor Gregory for coming along tonight.